Hello. Oh, it's easier to just use the microphone. Everybody can take their seats. This is always I go up to everybody with the microphone. Hello. We're gonna get started. We're gonna get started. You come take your seat. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, I know it's only two days before Thanksgiving, so it's great that we have uh, such a good turnout. Um, actually, it's what's, what's great is that it looks like there's, I don't know, I'm, I'm doing a quick, it looks like maybe 50 people or something like that. Yeah, so it's a pretty good turnout for two days before Thanksgiving. Before Thanksgiving. Thanks. And um, I'm, I decided to have a little bit of fun this month and uh, uh, offer a little bit of reward for first and second place. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the first place will have their choice of which book, and second place gets the other one. We have uh, these O'Reilly books, uh, Data Analytics with Hadoop, and um, Data Wrangling with Python. Uh, both are developed by uh, people that are have or are currently on the board of Data Community DC. So I'm very proud of uh, this work people that we have in our network. And they're great books, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're looking to get in touch with anybody, uh, my mm -hmm. handle is Sean M. Gonzalez. Uh, Kareem, uh, stand up so everybody can uh, recognize you. Um, right. he, Kareem is helping us uh, uh, starting in 2017, and he's kind of getting used to everything. So um, probably starting in February. And of course, you all know Anthony. You're going to see him in a second. Um, and uh, Data Community DC, uh, everybody here knows Data Community. We have a bunch of different groups, women data scientists, statistical programming, night owls, data education, data science. Uh, but we've been expanding, and we also have full stack data science, uh, data wranglers, um, and Nova data science. So if there, there's, there's certain uh, uh, benefits to being part of the community, uh, one of which is there's sort of like an insurance on sponsorship. Um, and uh, there's other services to help with organizing. In certain situations, uh, we can live stream events. We have uh, a staff to help things out. We have uh, bank accounts, so that way, like um, when uh, DC Femtech was looking for um, a little bit of help, we tech lady hackathon, right? Um, don't remember which one. Uh, yes, uh, we could have helped them out a little bit um, through Women Data Scientists and. Of course, if you want to see any of this later, just go and Google us. Uh, we have our own YouTube channel now. Um, and uh, if you're interested in being a speaker, we um, actually, as a direct result of working with uh, Kate, um, we decided to put up a page uh, to so people could ask to be a speaker. So all you have to do is go to our site. There's a thing at the top for speakers. If you're interested in speaking, just go ahead and put your name down. We'll get in touch with you. Um, we have a number of partner companies, General Influence, uh, ATA, Krish Corp, Berkdale Media. If you are interested in, um, uh, uh, if you know these companies, you're looking for an introduction, you want to know more about companies in data science, come talk to us afterward. Um, there's uh, a number of things. First of all, Chief is hiring. Um, so if you're into, I mean, Kate, uh, Casey, do you know anything about the current opportunities here? This is a great place to work. I really enjoyed working with Scott, and uh, hopefully it'll have us again for 2017. Let me know how much you, you love these events. Uh, and otherwise, there's a, a number of things. There's uh, a, a chief data officer up in New York if you're into uh, social network analysis and stuff like that. Um, that's an opportunity, SAS developers, Oracle, SQL. 
Okay. Um, AOL is still a sponsor. Uh, always looking for more organizational sponsors. It's the end of the year, this happens. Um, and uh, education is, is, and I guess I really forgot to turn it over, didn't I? Yeah. I just got into a rhythm. Didn't you? Didn't oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, really thank you all for coming two days before Thanksgiving. It's going to be a great time tonight. we got some great guest speakers, lightning talks coming up. So uh, just to go through our organizational sponsors, we have AOL, a uh, great company. They put America online. Woo! <laughs> Your company here, a uh, great company. Don't really know what they do. Maybe you do. Uh, we got District Data Labs, great weekend courses on data science, the Data Society, uh, another great educational course, and statistics.com. And you get 50% off all uh, statistics.com courses off Stash DC with that code DC2. And we really want to thank uh, Chief and NVIDIA for being our Escher sponsors because Chief provides the space and NVIDIA has really let us do a lot of data biz work with them. Now, before I go on, I'm gonna go off script here for a second and just say thank you to all of you because you really are our best sponsors and our best patrons. I know we were all around here for November 4th and we may have not liked the outcome or we, we may have, but what really matters is that we stay in DC for the long haul no matter what happens, <laughs> and we go out, and we really just take whatever opportunities there are to take opportunities, to further ourselves, to further the profession, to further and really develop into who we want to be no matter what the country does. So, <laughs> I really want to say thank you for coming out, and I really hope to see you guys at more DC biz and DC data community, DC events, because no matter what, we can make data great again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, announcements, open mic. Anybody has an announcement? Uh, you know, any events coming up? If you have uh, a job opportunity, if you're looking for something, if you just want somebody to mentor you on something, if you feel like getting up and practicing for public speaking <laughs> So I'm kind of working with um, Data Kind DC. <laughs> So if you don't know about DataKind DC, we kind of work with different nonprofits and use data science to figure needs for that individual organization. I'm representing, sort of not really representing, I'm working with Kiva right now, which does microfinance all over the world. And one of our newest project, projects is um, analyzing repayment rates in the United States, um, targeting microloans especially, specifically for United States um, borrowers. So if you're interested in helping out, let me know. Um, my name is Jonathan Jaw. Find me after this. Hey everybody, I'm Alex. I've been thinking about announcing this at an event for forever, so I'm really excited to do it. Uh, we're, it's not even 100 yet, but we're so close, I'm just gonna call it. Uh, Georgetown University is launching a new master's program probably in the fall of this coming year. It's a master's of science in data science and public policy. Uh, if you are interested or know anyone who's interested in that overlap and might be considering graduate education, feel free to come talk to me. Uh, I'm going to be involved in the program and teaching it. Uh, so I'd be happy to tell you more if you're interested. Thanks. Next person's probably going to be on the other side. Anybody? Okay. No? No? Nobody else? Pepperidge Farm remembers when there was somebody else. And, um, Sue? Uh, already showed that. I just, I just love these things. These are just uh, uh, um, visualizations of previous events that we've had, and I get a kick out of them every time, so I show them. Um, we'll usually go and have drinks at the Big Hunt afterwards. Uh, so Google says to go out and around by DuPont Circle, but there's a shortcut. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I know about the shortcut, and Google doesn't. So Google doesn't know everything. Um, and uh, with that, I just wanted to say a quick thing about the 
uh, speakers. Um, Kate and I uh, met uh, when um, she recognized that Data Community was not uh, featuring women speakers at the same rate that they are in data science. Um, and uh, you know, this has been a challenge for Data Community for a number of years. Uh, we've begun to address it by including Women Data Scientists DC, but uh, you know, getting speakers has always been a challenge, and we've been collaborating together on um, getting women speakers in, and actually, because of your work, uh, the first three for 2017 uh, are directly as a result of your work, so thank you very much. <laughs> presenting uh, her work uh, in that area. David Clare, uh, Booz Allen, um, he's uh, taken a, a, seri a bunch of data on the transition uh, of Donald Trump into presidency. We'll be showing an analysis on that, so that should be interesting. And David Aja, who uh, we got the approval for the data to be released, <laughs> um, because he was going to speak before, and if anybody was here, we pulled an audible and, and got uh, uh, speakers in at the last minute. Uh, but now we can show the EFS dashboard that he put together himself in Shiny, and um, we'll be showing the um, uh, employee surveys over the course of two years, I believe, and uh, what it means to GAO. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kate Rivera. just talk about, let's just dive right in and talk about why that's different. Um, so in 2016, at the major uh, DC data and tech meetups, there were no women speakers at single speaker events. And since this is Data to DC, um, I'll mention that you know I had a fairly interesting challenge of how do you visualize data when your most important uh, data point is zero? Because um, often that would be an absence. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of lollipop charts for the sake of lollipops, but in uh, the sense here, I really like it because you can actually see that yes, in fact, for every single one of those meetups, at every single single speaker event, uh, there were no women, and the number of male speakers was definitely not zero. Um, so we're not breaking that trend tonight, because tonight we're at a multi-speaker event, um, and multi-speaker events fared a little better, uh, shout out to Data Innovation DC, which actually had more women speakers than men in 2016. Um, but that is an anomaly by far. Most meetups uh, just don't have women speakers at all. Or if they do, it's one or two women speakers uh, within 2016. So some of you might be looking at this. You might have some feelings, initial reactions about um, why this might be the case. I'm gonna make this efficient and just go through some of the feedback that I initially got um, in terms of when I presented this data. So first off, if you don't know, women this refers to women data scientists, which is a really great organization that's part of um, Data Community DC. It is great that women data scientists features mostly women speakers. Um, and so DC is fortunate to have a vibrant women in tech community. I'm a part of it. I love it. It serves an important purpose. That is not an excuse and should never be an excuse for why there are not women at uh, gender neutral events. To, to say that that is an excuse is to imply that data scientists are by default and normally men and that women can and should be relegated to separate spaces. So no, just <laughs> no. Um, this next one is, um, I took out individuals' names because I did. Um, but I agree that the events do need evening out, but women are only about 10, 12% of data science. Um, so that statistic is neither relevant nor true, if we're gonna be honest here. Um, so there are multiple disciplines that can provide valuable insight into data and tech, and Data Viz DC is actually a good example of this. At their most, I think your last meetup, it was actually a journalist that came. Yes. Yes, so it doesn't have to be purely a data scientist or purely a tech person to provide value. But even so, I don't know where the statistics came from. I can tell you it's not right. It either relies on either too narrow definition of data science 
or you're relying on self-reporting, both of which are going to underestimate the proportion of women. That is probably in and of itself a larger conversation that uh, goes beyond 15 minutes, but I think we can all agree that the proportion of women in data and tech in DC is not actually zero, <laughs> and yeah. that is the proportion of women speakers at single speaker events in 2016. Um, so I guess I'm gonna keep that too. Data can DC, it's a great analysis. Um, and we store sort of speakers through our members. Have a list that you'd like to share. I want you to like hold this tweet in your mind for a little bit, because I'm gonna be referencing it again and again. Um, so first off, when you rely on your current networks, and your current networks are all male speakers and mostly male attendees, that is not good. That creates a feedback loop that makes it difficult for women and minorities to step up. So you're gonna have to do a little more work. And um, as organizers of major professional groups in DC, I think it is the responsibility of these organizers to not only reflect, but also encourage the diversity of the industry. Um, yes, this means you should not take a passive approach to selecting speakers and just choose whoever comes your way or whatever friend is available. But this right here is like one of the fancier meetup events I've ever been to. It's being live streamed. Um, there are sponsors. There's like a whole job connection situation. I think some time could be spent better investigating the diversity of speakers. It's merely a priority. Um, so yeah, they mentioned, do you have a list? And so, yes, there are no kids in the audience. I fucking made that list. Um, and so let's talk about how we can fix this. And how do we fix this? Oh, sorry. How do we fix this? That fucking list that I made. Um, so I created a website, uh, we speak here.org, and it is a website where DC women and non-binary individuals can say, hey, I'd really like to speak at your data or tech event. These are my specialties. These are the languages I know. It is entirely self-submission. It's about two weeks in. We have nearly 60 uh, people on the list. And you should get on this list if it applies to you. You should encourage others to uh, get on this list. And you should make organizers use this list. So this kind of gets at the speaker problem. And there's another problem here, and that's the problem of environment. I know a lot of music organizers, I know they're great people, and I know they want great spaces, um, but there are a ton of people that come to meetups, and you need to make sure that you are creating a safe space for everyone. And the baseline to do that is to have a code of conduct. I've looked, and Data Community DC either doesn't have or has like so thoroughly hidden their code of conduct that it doesn't exist. Um, so why do you need a code of conduct? It is a simple way to communicate the type of environment that you are looking to set at your event. It lays out what is acceptable and what is unacceptable behavior, and when there is unacceptable behavior, uh, what means someone can go to organizers to have that resolved. Because what happens now is we speak to can kind of have like a double meaning. Uh, women can speak on space, stage like I am right now, but also like when y'all aren't around, we speak to ourselves and we speak about uh, the meetups where guys hit on us or the meetups where guys immediately assumed that we were beginners and recommended a GA course. And <laughs> so we're all talking about these things and we have a mental list of guys and meetups and organizations that just are not cool. So it is uh, also a responsibility of meetup organizers to uh, create a better environment. And the first step should be a code of conduct. These are both things that organizations can do. There are also some things that individuals can do. So one is to be decent. Even if there is no code of conduct, you should most certainly act like there's a code of conduct. Um, elevate women and minorities in your field, and this goes two ways. Uh, you should be telling them that their work is awesome, and you should be also telling your networks that their work is awesome. You should also voice your need for diversity. This is especially true for you white men. 
you should be saying that you want more diverse speakers in more diverse spaces. Uh, why should you be doing this? One, because it's just like, it's the right thing to do. Um, but also, when the burden of diversity advocacy falls on women and minorities, that sets everybody back. And what do I mean? I mean that somebody asked me to make a list, so yeah, I made that fucking list. But that list took me time to make. It took, takes me a lot of time to maintain that list, and with all that time, I could have been doing other things. Because I have a very long list of like technical things that I <laughs> want to be doing, and I'm not doing them because I'm advocating for diversity. And because this is something that often is the responsibility of women and minorities, it means that a lot of their technical work or their technical opinions can fall to the wayside as a result of having to focus on this. So white guys, make your voices heard. Um, and with that in mind, I'm gonna spend the rest of this time talking about some cool data this work by local women that y'all should check out. Um, sorry. And I'm gonna like introduce myself all over again. Um, hi, my name is Kate Rabinowitz. I run a website, and that website is Data Lens DC. Uh, what do I do on that website? I analyze and visualize data about the district. So this right here is a map of all of DC homes and the year that they were built. Um, so I like to look at um, demographic changes, okay. housing trends, uh, food, culture, lots of different things through the lens of data that is open or I make open, and then I visualize it to tell stories. So, each color is the year the home was built. So this yellow color is the house that was built before 1915. This kind of um, like orangey is 1915 to 1930, and then the darkest color is after 1950. After 1950. So you can see in like this inner core, this is where most of the older homes are. You can see like anyone who's watched on Capitol Hill knows this to be true. And when you, as you go to the outer edges of the city, um, they're essentially newer homes. Um, that's a really good question. So um, some of it is from open data that is <coughs> out of. Some of it is from websites that I scrape. Some of it is data that I just create. Um, and some of it is data that I FOIA. So lots of different ways. Um, but I am not the only one. Uh, NPR has some really great women on their team. And you all have probably seen this map, or maybe only some of you have. Um, this is the spending per student, per school district, and it was done by two really great women at NPR. Uh, Brittany Fogg is a Tableau ambassador here in DC, and this is a recent and relevant story of hers looking at um, fake news stories on Facebook. Uh, this is Catherine Madden, who has previously spoken at Data Viz DC. Yeah, you, you missed, the, your, your zero chart missed on her by one month. <laughs> well, I, I don't feel bad about that. <laughs> so, um, if you like Dear Data, or kind of more uh, personally drawn data, uh, Catherine Madden does excellent work. Uh, Hannah Rett, who just left us, so, I'm gonna say y'all should feel like very bad because you missed a really great talk. This is, okay, if y'all watch Earth, Pork and Black, yeah! you know that it's, it's a show where there are clones. And she took every single clone character and looked at their appearances on every single episode and she vised them out. That's incredible. And she's not even here in DC anymore to tell you about it. I'm sorry. But also, I'm not. Um, so Jennifer Stark does really awesome work looking at algorithms and how they work. So this specifically here is she looked at Uber wait times. And the redder it is, the longer the wait time. Um, so she kind of goes into the back end of figuring out how things like Uber, or if you Google a politician's profile, what picture comes up. She does a lot of cool work around that. Um, this is Lisa. This is like a simple idea that is so just incredible. Um, these are cities 
along the same latitude. And it kind of blew my mind to think that Chicago and Rome and New York and Madrid and Beijing are all basically like perfectly aligned. And it's not something, it's certainly not something I've ever thought about. And if I think about it in my own kind of personal mental map, that is not the case. Um, so fairly simple data, but very illuminating graphic. Um, this is Marie Whitaker. She does weekly DC uh, data visualization for uh, DC government. This one in particular is salaries in DC. So you can see I selected the computer and mathematical. So you can see that the median salary for mathematicians is, I'm gonna call it like 120. Um, and then on like the low end is computer user support specialist, but there's a lot of variety there. Uh, Rebecca Bovro, who is on the board of Data Communities DC? She just started helping with Data Science DC, so she technically yeah. isn't, but she's very close in a lot of ways. Yes, um, so she just created Yellow Brick, which is um, a Python library, which helps you visualize data science models and get a, help you get a better sense of kind of what are the interactions between the various. Um, Does, doesn't it interact with scikit-learn, right? And um, I think it's scikit-learn, no? I think that's right. Yeah, and it helps to, through visualization, helps to um, actually use the tool by visualizing it. And she's with da District Data Labs, so she did it with DDL, so. Great. And then I only chose 10, because I didn't want to, I could do this all night. Um, <laughs> but Vox also does some really great graphics. And this is one um, done by Sarah. And it looks at basically what are the concerns of Republican versus Democrat doctors, if you've seen this. So Republican doctors are really freaking concerned if you've had an abortion or you've smoked marijuana. Um, Democratic doctors, not so much, but they are concerned if you own a gun and have small children. Um, <laughs> which is like, so maybe you know where you fit in that spectrum and that helps. Um, so that is just like the tiniest of glimpses into all the great women in DC doing data this work, doing data work, doing tech work. Um, you can find the methodology, the data, and the code behind all those first graphs on my GitHub. The website is wespeaktu.org, and I am Kate Rubinowitz. Thank you. 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 Thank Uh, I'd like to do it when it's in the moment, because otherwise people forget. Okay, so it's going to give five minutes for it. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so Anthony will run that mic, and then she needs a mic, and so Anthony, you need to grab the extra mic. And help but you can also just like talk so, to me. But anyway, yes, know. questions. Is the volume is okay. speaking into microphones, but I actually <laughs> want to say, first of all, thank you. Um, I've been around longer than I care to admit. Um, I got one of the earlier degrees in data science and then operations research. Um, and I've like, got a million comments I want to make, but I'm going to spare you guys. But uh, I just want to say, I have a 16-year-old daughter who is beautiful and smart and wonderful, and she's also non-binary. And so just as I was saying to my colleague, John Tyndall, <laughs> she, she didn't mention, she's talking about male and female, she didn't mention non-binary, up it came in the chart. So I just wanna say thank you, and give you a shout out, and be your best friend. Thank you, and just to be clear, so we speak to is also for non-binary individuals, and the reason that you didn't see that on the graph is because there was just zero for everything. <laughs> Um, and I did identify gender by pronoun, so I didn't do some kind of like name guessing game. Um, First off, thanks for having this tough conversation to have. <laughs> it's really hard for even the guys to hear it. But as a minority, you know, one of the, I work with AIGA, which is the Graduate Arts uh, Association in diversity inclusion, and it's tough to have this conversation with stakeholders when we're not part of the stakeholders. So 
without completing and actually even putting in the list is pretty effective. But my question to you is how do how would you recommend you know the rest of us in other fields or other I don't know uh, micro industries like graphic design or UI UX to kind of have that seat at the table without having to feel like oh we just add, we need a black guy on this ad or we need uh, we need to add more diversity to our team and they don't consider the talent so how do you how do you go about that because I don't want to be I don't want somebody hiring me just because I'm black. You know? Yes. Did you have a question or did you want to respond to that? I would love to respond. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's open this up. <laughs> okay, so um, what, from my perspective, in my experience, one of the biggest problems is just emphasizing diversity as value in and of itself. Um, there's so much out there, there's statistics, there's facts, there's so much research done out there that shows diverse groups, diverse organizations mm -hmm. are far more successful than organizations lacking diversity. And organizations that value diversity overtly and do the best they can for diverse groups are more successful than organizations that simply include diversity just to get over with it. So there, there's data out there, and I mean, I don't know anything offhand because I didn't plan on having anything offhand, but I mean, just basic research, just Google it, there's so much research out there, and I think just educating and promoting and just, you know, I guess banging the gong on, you know, in terms of the facts um, that support diversity and support um, inclusion, not just as something that we should just value, like, okay, you know, in themselves, that's, that's great, but sometimes to have that substance that shows that, yes, it's better than it just as an ethical thing, but as you know, if you value your organization, if you want to actually be profitable, if you want to see you know a positive outcome for society as a whole, this is something that you should do. And that's I guess just what she said. Uh -huh. A thousand percent, yes. And I think you're gonna add on. Yeah, I had a simpler answer. For every job you get, because you are diverse, quote unquote, there's ten jobs you didn't get because of that, so I wouldn't worry about it. Just do your job well, and don't worry why they hired you. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm, I'm gonna take a moment to take a, 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 a advantage of this situation um, and say that, you know, you mentioned that the community has all these resources, right? And the resources came because I basically quit my job and put my own personal money in in order to go hustle and figure out how to raise money for an organization like this. Um, because bringing that money in is incredibly difficult. Um, and what I landed on was the whole jobs thing. And the reason I'm doing that here in this type of area is because if you make a recommendation, if you uh, put a friend forward, uh, if you say good things about a friend, if you give them the right recommendation, that makes the entire process of finding the right people much, 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 much easier. It turns into a conversation and a relationship instead of those, I don't know, does anybody else get those 800 numbers where you have some person from another country calling you about a C++ job in Alaska and you don't want to go, you know, and then you add them to the block list and it doesn't work. I'm trying to change that model into this type of community helping each other and in the process being able to live stream, being able to support women's efforts. Uh, and, um, that's my goal. I don't know if it'll work or not, but that's my goal. I'm gonna speak to this. Um, I'm not a coder, but I'm a sociologist and I've been studying gender issues in science for a long time. And I'm also a woman who's been the only woman in a lot of meetings for many, many, many years. And I think you're hitting upon an issue that's much bigger than this particular domain. And I think the complexity of the issue is bigger than this domain. And I actually want to offer a word of sort of help. <laughs> you know, like I personally view this as not a male, female, binary issue of personal identity. Right now, I think we're stuck with the issue of skill set. And how do you engage people who have not had access to certain skills and make sure that they have the skills so that when the jobs are available, people don't even think about your gender, you just do you have the skills. 
And I think in the visualization field, at least from the work that I've been doing, it's very new. This is very new. And unfortunately in science, women in science, it's just a, it's a problem. In any, whether you're an engineer or a visual, you know, whatever. So I think, I think, I, I just, I, I think the idea is to create an environment where everybody <coughs> feels like they can share and everybody feels like they're going to be looked at for their skill set. Um, and that, I, I just come back to the U.S. and I feel like the, the gender politics is so powerful here. It sort of blocks the ability to really work in terms of innovations in science, which is what I think, or innovations in, in uh, visualization. If I could ask a question, how many people here use GitHub or any like code repository or code pasting? How many people feel as if gender is a factor that determines what libraries you use or what products you commit to? Interesting. Right. <laughs> So we kind of feel like the like we kind of feel like GitHub is like more sharing spaces, more shared coding environments, like gender neutral. It's all based on meritocracy. Who has the best idea? I'm gonna put in there for a sec. Yeah, actually, Chris, you put in. Well, you can make your statement. Uh, no, I'll let Chris take this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to quickly note that it's been shown that even in this uh, anonymous online space that code contributions pull requests from people who were identified by, by their avatar as women uh, were less likely to be accepted, more likely to, to have pushback. So I think even in these online spaces, there's still a, we bring a lot of our real world uh, biases and prejudices with us. And so there is no perfect solution. We have to work on this everywhere. Yes, absolutely. And there was recently some like Silicon Valley tech executive who was like, ladies, don't use your name on GitHub. Or like, only use your first initial. Don't let people know you're ladies. Um, so, yeah. 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 Oh yeah. That was that was legitimate professional advice. Um, in the world of I believe. Um, what year? Like months ago. Yeah. Like, now you like. Yeah, like, it was in the Wall Street Journal. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that is not safe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, go ahead. So I just wanted to jump on this, uh, I think, wonderful point about uh, skill set and, and how we think about people who um, are data scientists. So one of, the, one of the numbers I wanted to say, Kate brought up is that 12% number, which I think is, is almost certainly ridiculous. So one of the reasons, it's, there's no way it's completely <laughs> reasonable, right? And one of the major reasons why, so if you look at the percentage of people who get statistics degrees in the US, it's 40% of them. If a larger number of those people were identifying as data scientists, which they might do if they came to events like this, or if they knew people came to events like this, that already dramatically, like that number's blown out the window and completely gone. So I really think there's a big factor of this identification, and as well as skill set that sort of feeds into whether people show up or not. And also, okay, I don't know if you on this and say that is really true because unlike being a doctor or a lawyer where you get a degree and then you are by factor that degree that profession data science is very new and people are just kind of calling themselves that and like well does anyone actually know what that means <laughs> but um but like for me i didn't realize that i was like a data scientist until i was taking this graduate statistics course and i was in this group and I don't want to be mean, but there was a guy who needed a lot of help, and I was helping him a lot. And then he connected with me on LinkedIn, and his LinkedIn profile was like, data scientist extraordinaire. Like, knows <laughs> all the data science. And I was like, it's like throw up table. If he can do this, I can do this. <laughs> what, about of what, about, what about diversity of political beliefs? Would you hire a Trump supporter? <laughs> I don't hire right now. So, I don't, that's like not applicable. I, I don't, I, I'm going to say I, we can't think that way. We can't think that it has to, if you're a Trump supporter, then you're out. Um, one of the things that I'm currently looking into is like, okay, what happened? Uh, how do we take people who can work remotely and bring them into uh, the other areas of the United States that are, well, we don't necessarily go to and, and make a connection using our tech background? That's like a little side project of mine because it is not Trump or, 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 or Hillary. It's not Republican or Democrat. These are good people out there in the world, and 
fake news and bad information and you know manipulation of media. Can't think that way. You gotta think bigly. bigly. <laughs> So you mentioned a common refrain is that uh, we recruit speakers from the people who show up, the, the people in the community. Uh, so that I think begs the question, have you then increased the diversity of your attendance at meetups? Like what are some strategies well, so for that? One, um, I bet if you have more women speakers, more women will show up. There are lots of women in tech and women in data organizations in DC. So working more closely with them, DC Femtech is an umbrella organization that has like, I don't know, like 15 organizations under, Women Data Scientists DC being one of them, but like actually connecting with Women Who Code, Hear Me Code, um, other DC Femtech organizations, establishing those relationships, and like just trying a little bit to say hi and you're welcome and please come and what you do is awesome. Thanks. I think we got to call it. Um, we, we do have two other speakers. This has been incredible. It's a great conversation. One more round of applause for you. <laughs> David Blair, there we go. You have your um, computer ready? Let's get that set up. While well, I'm plugging this in, um, let me introduce <laughs> uh, the. Well, let's get set up for us. Hopefully, it's that simple. Magic! Come on, everybody with me. <laughs> These things don't always work. Okay. 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 So we can search for the presentation. Now, um, I'd like to introduce kind of the intellectual driving force of this project uh, with the change and change management. Uh, Dr. Patrick McCree, she's going to talk a little bit about the theory that animates this and and, and uh, the application of it to, to government. Yes, that's right. Immediately after a conversation on diversity, you get two white guys, so <laughs> sorry for that. <clears throat> In all seriousness, I came important topic. If, if you haven't thought about it, most of you guys out there are going to have daughters one day. You can start now, solve the problem for your daughters. If, if, if for no other reason, that's a good enough one. As the father of three daughters, I think about it all the time. And um, the work that we are presenting tonight, <clears throat> it's a little bit different. Uh, we have been struggling with the challenge uh, within Booz Allen for a long time of change management in federal organizations and how do you help federal organizations go through change. They're about to go through pretty significant change with the transition. And you, you've heard a lot of the data points already, but there's over 2 million federal employees and there's 4,000 political appointees that are about to come in. So you do the math. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of challenges in getting that 2 million uh, person group to move, uh, even with 4,000 political appointees. It's not as if it's gonna happen overnight. It's not as if it's gonna happen. Uh, a lot of those things that are <laughs> desires and wishes of the politicals with it, that will come into Washington will die in the hands of bureaucracy. And why is that? What are the reasons for that? And we have been working with clients over the years to try to get them to adopt very sensible changes that are very moderate. So now imagine if there is some sort of philosophical backlash to some of the policies and procedures that are about to be brought in, it only gets more difficult. So <clears throat> this research, which we're presenting tonight through visualization, uh, goes back to uh, attachment theory. Is anyone familiar with the concept of attachment theory? Yeah, little babies get attached to their moms, and then it's really hard for them to move on if their moms aren't there. They have a very biological attachment. Well, it doesn't go away as we get older. We just attach to different things. We attach to city, we attach to jobs, we attach to physical settings, we attach to new people. Uh, these are all different attachments that we take on in our lives. And the theory that we were exploring here is that federal employees have attachments too, and that those attachments are critical to the way that they will respond to change. So if you were young and you really wanted your mom, so maybe you went to a blanket. And that blanket was basically the transfer of the attachment from the mother to an object. And that's called a transition object. 
There are transition objects that can help adults through change as well. And what we were trying to do with our research was uncover what are some of the symptoms that show us whether individuals are having attachments, and then we could potentially mitigate those attachments. That is a really long description for something that's pretty simple for what we're about to show you. Because what we're gonna show you is an index out of the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. It's uh, 86 questions asked for the last 15 years. I think it's very similar to another topic we're gonna have next. And <clears throat> what we did that's a little bit different is we tried to build an index for specifically that attachment uh, that individuals might have within an organization. And what we're showing you here is organizational data, so we're not getting to the individual level. We could do that, but the data is really not that parsed uh, across organizations to be able to say individuals in this particular group have a certain kind of attachment. So instead, what we've done is looked at the agency level. And Dave is gonna present some of this, and then I'm gonna kinda come back to wrap up what, what we think this means. Okay, so we're gonna be using the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey uh, data to kind of look at these uh, these issues that may infirm change or promote it, and kind of as the background for how this is going to be delivered and how we're putting this into the world, we're doing a series of articles with Bloomberg Government um, and, and on, online uh, talking about change and the transition uh, between administrations. This is going to be featured in one of the articles soon, so our intended audience, I think, the, the real the, the audience that we we are really hoping to get and capture are uh, government managers and administrators. So they read about this, they hear this theory, sitting drinking their coffee, like, oh my god, okay, uh, change has been maybe cracked, uh, I need to look further into this, I've heard that there's some visualization of data to be had. Um, so, they want to find out, they want to see a little bit more, they want to do all the things you can do with data, they want to see how different people compare, or how different agencies compare, so on and so forth. But probably the first thing they're really gonna wanna know is like, how is my organization doing? So uh, we linked to this first page where a, a you can look up a, a customized report for an agency on the different indicators in the Fed survey uh, related to the, this model of change. Um, and it gives an overall readiness score and graphically shows the uh, the the different symptoms that can occur of change. So, and that, that can be represented at risk. So we have uh, symptoms including motivation, productivity, morale, absenteeism, conflict, and turnover. And all of these, if they're not in the right ranges, can, can present a risk to successful change. So they come here, they see, how am I doing on the overall change readiness uh, scale there? How am I doing on each of these little symptoms? Are any of these a problem? Uh, and then they can see for the items that relate to those symptoms how they did. And they can go and they can click around and be like, oh, who's, who's interested in something here? Uh, how about one that's gonna be in the news? Immigration, Customs Enforcement. How ready do they, how, might, how ready might they be for change? Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, this is gonna be an interesting story, right? This is right in the news, okay? And according to the 2015 data, there's some impediments to, to change in, 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 the agency, in that agency. Um, we can kind of see there might be some morale issues uh, right around here where a lot of people strongly disagree with a, a positively worded item about, about morale. Um, what's another one that might be in the news? How about veterans benefits? How's this gonna go? Let's see, oh, okay. So we're kind of stacking the deck here for a, a long four years. Um, so, but let, you know, who's who might be good at, who might be ready for change? Who, who would really like the job? If I were an astronaut or someone who hangs out with astronauts, I'd be totally into that. Um, oh, okay, the Glenn Research Center looks ready for change. You know, no, no risks, no nothing above a low risk on any of the potential symptoms. So they can get their fix of like, how am I doing? Okay, they get and they get all these things in a verbal kind of description. So it's a low risk. We're not giving them like, you're 2.1 out of 4.9. Uh, it's all, all words. Um, so you can see kind of this little personalized report card, and then you can move on. And this is my favorite. This is, this is where I, I really uh, got kind of cheesed on it. Uh, who is ready for change? This is the distribution of all the agencies across these six, six kind of risk factors for, for successful change. Um, and this was done in GGI wrapper. GRF. Um, 
is, if, that, if that's how you say it, I'm not, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Um, and this is essentially ggplot2 with some interactive components to it, and it's the, the syntax is pretty like straightforward if you know ggplot2. So here we have the six symptoms in kind of columns. Uh, each agency is a dot that's repeated across six symptoms. So if I put the tooltip over, I can see which agency it is. I can select the agency or unselect it and watch kind of the constellation across symptoms. Um, and as I click agencies, uh, they populate a list below that again gives kind of the, the lowdown on their, the, on their potential risks against change. Um, and they, they're the color coded according to the department. In this graph, we kind of already get some interesting insights. Uh, we kind of, because we see the distribution of the different symptoms that can, that can impede change. Uh, absenteeism, there's not much variability in that, whereas there is a lot of variability in morale and motivation. Kind of suggests maybe absenteeism is something that you can manage against, right? Like you can make sure people show up ish, you know? Um, whereas morale, like, if I tell you to smile, it's not gonna be fun. Um, so here we have, you know, kind of the, the general, broad, the wide angle view of how people are doing on, on this. And then we come to, so the, the, the items that we use in this index are obviously a subset um, of, of all the FEV items, FEVs items. Uh, in here, we have, you can pick any question and compare two agencies. It's like a, a battle um, between agencies, which one's gonna have the highest. So we see here we have Glenn Research Center, uh, you know, a, a uh, agency that we think will do well, and, and Immigration Customs Enforcement, which uh, may have some issues. Uh, we can choose a quick question here. Uh, I'm guessing that the most likely comparisons will be within within families, within departments. So you know, we can look at CBP and look them up and see how they compare and how they all compare to the average. So within the department, fairly similar, but they both look a little bit different compared to the average. Um, if we were to look at, say, Langley, also a NASA group, like, whoa, that, if the question is my work is me feeling a personal accomplishment, they really feel fairly good about those things. And, uh, the CIA yeah. Well, I got, it would have a suit in it, wouldn't it? Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't think so, actually. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. Is, is that? Okay, well, if, if it's not that great a secret, I guess. You know, but, and that's, that's the app. So, you know, see how you're doing, see how everyone does, and, you know, Pokemon battle the, the, the agencies. <laughs> so let me walk you through just a couple of use cases of how we would use this. Would you mind going back to the agency report, Dave? So let's pull up uh, CMS, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. So uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, we have looked at the data over multiple years. We're just showing you 2015 tonight. Uh, but what you see here is an organization that's had a significant amount of change over the last number of years. They've been primarily responsible for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And yet they remain what we consider to be a change-ready organization. Why is that? A lot of investment excitement about their mission, a lot of energy around what they're doing. You can see where that would lead to you know, maybe some higher uh, morale, maybe some higher productivity because people are jazzed to come to work. I think that's really the story for NASA as well, is that if you're jazzed to come to work, then change feels less threatening. If you're not jazzed to come to work, then change can be a little more threatening. Um, let's also, let's throw in the Secret Service. So, uh, if you have paid attention to the news much over the last couple of years, this is an organization yeah. that's not very happy. Uh, they've had kind of, uh, they had some things that were considered perks and benefits that are no longer available to them. And as a result of that, uh, what you see is an organization that's not uh, really willing to change. <clears throat> they, were on, they were actually a very positive and what we would have called change-ready organization back in 2010, and they have fallen dramatically. And uh, a, big, a big reason for that is that they feel like part of their mission has been uh, cut out from under them. The same is true of CBP, uh, where uh, they have had, uh, they, the corruption scandals were so bad they had to have a leader come from the outside to clean them up. So these are, these are the kinds of things that impact an organization's overall attitudes, and FEBS is a measure of overall attitudes. 
Uh, but what we're trying to highlight here is really that, that willingness to change. And we think that as the new administration comes in, that this is going to be kind of a helpful tool for people to kind of assess where their agency is. If you're a political leader coming in, this gives you a sense of where you sit. If you're already there uh, and have to manage from manage up and manage down at the same time, this might be able to help you do it. Yes? Do you have a program that might work? is really interesting, but I'm wondering if you could, is this broken down by age? Do you have any demographics? Because I'm, I think age, longevity in the organization would have an impact. Yeah, so longevity, and, and I should have said this at the outset, uh, our co-researcher, Dr. Victoria Grady, is really the mind behind this. She has come up with the approach and uh, and the that we've just kind of replicated here. Fortunately, she had an injury and couldn't be here tonight, otherwise she would have been right here with us uh, presenting. Uh, she, um, she has looked at a number of organizations inside and outside of the government, and longevity is, is constantly uh, one of those factors that comes out as a differentiator, but it's an interesting differentiator. People who are in an organization six to ten years are often the ones that are most excited about the organization. Beyond ten years, and in, in kind of the one to five, that's where we find that they're less willing to change, when they're, they're less change ready. Uh, we do have the deep demographic variables that are available, but that was the kind of one variable that popped when we looked for correlations in the, across the data. Is this data available publicly? It all is, yes. Uh, we, it, it has kind of been liberated by the, uh, the Partnership for Public Service year over year. Uh, we uh, just took the publicly available data and did something different with it. I'd love it if you sent it to me or posted it directly on the meetup group so everybody can find it. And uh, is this tool going to be uh, available um, through your site, or can we host it for you, perhaps? Oh, well, it's it's already available. Um, we, uh, we're going to be... I noticed it's off your local server, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Behind you. Yeah, we, we do have it hosting right now. Uh, and as Dave mentioned, as part of our series with Bloomberg, it's going to go uh, go out publicly on December 7th. I'm, yes, December 7th, yes. And so I have a, maybe a, a question about how to read the data. Um, some of the stuff obviously doesn't vary that dramatically with changes in administration. You know, HR sort of related stuff, the perks you mentioned. Um, to some degree, that sort of stuff bleeds down to sort of mid-level, bureau-level management. However, most of these statistics, I would think, are heavily dependent on sort of how people view the direction and high-level policy goals of the agency. Over the last eight years, there's been, you know, definitely two camps, I think, in that area where some really, really, really supported and, and were enthusiastic about the mission of, of, the, of the administration and others were very, very deeply opposed to it. So if you're looking at, for example, the data around immigration or ICE, how do you read and how do you tease out, you know, how many of these people were, were supporting, in effect, a change in immigration policy that's broader and probably more consistent with the new administration coming in? For example, those guys, you know, maybe half of them are saying, Let, let's let's focus on some of the proposals that are existing. I mean, if I were just going to read this data and I'm looking at change ready, uh, NASA might not be all that excited about climate change, radical changes in policy, and the ICE people might be very enthusiastic and would be sort of suggesting the opposite trends. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at some of the questions that we're using here uh, around, uh, oops, hold on a second. Oh, uh, I would recommend my organization as a place to work. Uh, my work gives me a feeling of personal accomplishment. Uh, and uh, I feel encouraged to come up with new and better ways of doing things. Senior leaders generate high levels of motivation and commitment in the workforce. A lot of those things are going to be driven about the attitudes toward the, towards the organization at large and will be driven, I'd imagine, by some of the political leanings. Now, does that mean that tomorrow, or you know, the next time they take this in 2017, that everyone that was working at CMS on the Affordable Care Act that you know may be reversed, and then they're going to suddenly lose an attachment to their organization. Maybe, maybe not. Will I suddenly gain an attachment to the organization with high morale and motivation? I doubt it, because it's not always driven by just that. But you're right. We could probably dig a little bit deeper and figure out over time what's the what's the distribution look like. And, and maybe even isolate what's the administration change impact on, on some of these attitudes. Um, it's a great thing to study in the future. 
Uh, I, I think it's, uh, the data going back is a little harder to work with, so we don't have too much before the Obama administration that would be valuable for this, but it's something we could really do going forward. So it's good evening. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Up here. Uh, so Excuse me. Good evening. Um, the way new person, I've actually former Blue's Allen of 11 years, and I just left in order to join FEMA starting oh, in a week. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to go to FEMA? Interesting time. <laughs> 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 um, but I have two methodology questions for you, one of which I think actually builds on the point that was just raised, which is um, it seems to me that this methodology assumes that all changes proposed are equal and that the readiness of the organization is agnostic to what is being proposed. And I wonder if you could comment on that. And then the second question is, how did you test your methodology? Um, for example, how did you demonstrate that prediction of receptivity to change actually translated into actual acceptance of change? So I'll just hit on, it talk, talk about change. A lot of these may not be as uh, casually interesting as you may be thinking off the top of our heads. You know, change being building any sort of capability, an IT system change, you know, where you do your expense reports. Um, these can be expensive, long, and not fun changes. Uh, kind of that question of how, like, you know, the content of the change. And of course, the content of the change matters, um, but there's a lot of change that's perhaps a little bit more inert that we're, that we're kind of dealing with a lot um, that aren't as dramatic as, changes in integration enforcement, I think, um, that are nonetheless big. Uh, and your second question about prediction, mostly so far, we, we, we've done a number of kind of case studies where we look at, uh, according to people who have been around these agencies or been watching for a while, which did well, which didn't. Um, you know, the question of successful change measuring that is uh, an, a difficult abstract question. <coughs> Build on the on the on the first question. You know, I, I really think that we're not trying to uh, treat change equally. We're trying to say, you know, what is the attitudes of the organization today, you know, or at the point in time. I mean, it struck me that you could be looking at receptivity to change. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is like the baseline, the floor for which you would then say the it's it's almost like the point of no return. So, somebody who wants to. Uh, they're not going to be open to any change mm -hmm. based on these factors. Yeah. And that the best that an organization could hope for using this model would to say they are open to change, hope it's a good one, and they actually receive it well. Yeah, so if we've been looking, it's funny that you say that, because we've been looking at profiles right now. And we do think that there's kind of four profiles out there. There's the people who kind of attach to anything that is, or they're so attached to the organization that any change is a good change. Yeah. And you know they're just happy to be there. There's those that are gonna resist everything, and then there's probably two middle grounds. One that can be convinced through the heart, and one that can be convinced through the head. You know, they're, they're, that's kind of roughly what you could kind of imagine being there. Um, we haven't been able to parse the data in that way, and part of the, and part of this gets down to, and Dave hit on this, because a lot of changes in organizations are such at such a low level, you'd have to have that unit of analysis to be able to do it effectively. Maybe our next speaker will. That would be great if he has <laughs> if he has a little bit more at that level. Uh, for us, uh, we, you know, we're just we just have what's available, which is at the agency level. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, um, just a quick question. I know that as a federal employee, I'm filling out one of these in two weeks. So, are you guys going to be using the new data fairly soon? We use it as soon as it's released. The okay. way this is all set up. So 2016 has not had the top line results have been released, but not the in-depth data. So we have not been able to build this out for 16. As soon as it's available, we'll do it. Do you happen to know if that's going to be ready before the actual transition happens in inauguration? I don't think so. No, I'm getting a I'm getting a no up here from David. He's about <laughs> to speak on the same topic. So uh, no. Okay, thank we'll you. Go with his, uh, no. I have a question. Um, so this data was collected uh, before the new administration comes in. Once the new administration comes in, your population is going to change drastically, probably because a lot of these people are going to get downsized out. So I guess I'm wondering um, how you think this information is going to be used, and is it going to be useful in the next year or two? Like, what is the shelf life for it? Well, so I, I would push back on your assumption that there will be a lot of 
um, downsizing per se. Uh, I think that you what you could have is a lot of uh, natural attrition. Uh, that it's not as if the, the the workforce right now, the federal workforce has a lot of the the boomer generation that's ready to retire. If if there's a strong resistance to new policies and they decide to retire, then yes. The, the workforce could change dramatically, and there could be a desire to shrink the federal workforce, which would mean that those positions are not backfilled. But it's not as if people are going to be let go. In re you only have 4,000, you know, kind of po political appoint appointments, and that's even using the word loosely, that are going to change dramatically. So I, I think that kind of the core of, of the value of the organization is cons of this kind of study is consistent because you're still working with the federal workforce, but. Now that I push back on your assumption, let's. We'll, we'll okay. Well, so I guess I hear you, but maybe I'll reframe my question. Um, if the federal workforce is downsized, and I'm part of the federal workforce, mm -hmm. and that is what we're hearing, so I understand what you're saying about oh, attrition and you know retirees, blah blah blah. But the people in the federal workforce right now are actually looking at you know the whole drain, the swamp mentality, and that is actually a plan that is in the works. So if we assume that that's in the landscape, then what? Well, then the value of, the, of this information is, is less useful. I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I think you're, that was more, that's more of a statement than a question. I, I agree with that. Yeah, a, a lot of people um, who um, voted in the election, data shows that they they have now admitted that they lied about who they voted for. Um, I'm just curious to know if you've built in a margin of error for the number of employees that you have who might make dishonest responses. And I'm guessing that you know in the federal government there are probably more dishonest responses than. <laughs> Than, than there might be in the general population, given that people want to keep their jobs and, and want to answer appropriately. Yeah, I, I, I think you might be surprised at how honestly people are willing to answer a survey like this, but um, you know, that, that is kind of a given, uh, of course, uh, that people are answering honestly. The high correlations that exist within the survey around almost every question suggests that people are almost universally happy or universally sad about the workplace. Uh, and, it's, and it's not, and that seems to be consistent across agencies. So this is also not a representative survey. This rep the, 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 the individuals answering this are far greater than 20% of the total population of the workforce, which means that you get past margin of error. So you can't really bring that in uh, for something like this. It is, however, weighted using the, the weights that have been provided along with the data. Okay. Oh, we well, more just one, one more question. I, mean, I think uh, I've answered 15 of these surveys uh, myself, and I would say that um, at the very least, I think people, think if you're looking at attachment, they do lead public service. And I think you know that, that might be something to think about. The other thing is people do lead service when they don't think the mission you know, aligns with you know their, their career goals or whatever else. So I, I, I wonder, you know, if you're looking at things like do my managers support me and all that kind of stuff, the attachment piece, some of it's that mid-level management kind of problem. Um, but being able to tease out the difference between what were the statistics associated with essentially the Obama administration's policy goals and what are going to be associated with Trump. That would be a valuable visualization. But this, I, I think, you know, you run the risk of saying, um, you know, some of the agencies are, are very risk averse or, or change averse, where, you know, I'm not sure that the visualization is as convincing as if, if you differentiated what would be sticky and what would be. Just to yeah. that. Interesting. Okay. Oh, there's. Thanks so much, sir. Uh, my name is Gwyneth Walline, and um, I actually had a, a question, maybe possibly some observations, depending on what you would have to say in response. Um, one of the things that strikes me about um, being change ready is organizational culture, um, and some of these some of these indices that you're constructing get to that. One of the other things that I think, especially if you're talking about the um, the theory, like attachment theory, is control. And so one of the things that might be interesting to look at, and maybe you have already started to construct a way to do that, 
Um, I know the data are not super available below the level of the agency, but the ex to the extent that you would be able to identify markers of whether something is a project-based organization mm -hmm. as compared to a direct service That's type of organization, because that does tend to give you a sense of people having con control over their work. Um, and that would be really interesting to see how that would mix with some of the, the, the indices that you've constructed. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can give you a Ford example. Um, the, uh, the FHWA, which is, which is uh, grants-based, it's pro it is more of, a, more of a project-based organization, consistently pretty high uh, in, the, in the Fed's data compared to uh, uh, a lot of service organizations, including T TSA. So, you know, one of the hypotheses that I threw out early on in our research is that just working with the American people sucks. Right? <laughs> and so, if you, the more interaction you have, awesome. <laughs> uh, no, um, this, data, this data would suggest that the more, the more, uh, the higher level of interaction you have with customers, uh, the, 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 the worse you feel about your, your organization. <laughs> as, as well. um, it's not a, it's not perfect, um, but but yes, I think that just the extent to which we could go further into that line of research would be fascinating. Well, we've had a lot of really great conversation, and I saw the hand going up, but I have to move on. Um, so, a round of applause for David. Claire. <laughs> Last but not least, David Asha. You waited three months for this. <laughs> Here. There's a dude here, just a dude above? I forgot his name. <laughs> his name is Anthony, right? No. Is it not the HMI? that song? I only know that part. I am waiting in a line. I don't want to wait in this line. I wish I had to get a wire so I wouldn't have to wait in this line. I never heard this line. We all believe in fairies. I He has a Windows machine.
okay. We figured it out. Hey. Okay. So I was planning to get into the weeds of like how you set up your own Chinese application, but since all of the slides I would have used to do that are now gone, I think we can just, since we're already a little bit familiar with the context of uh, employee feedback survey data, I'll talk a little bit about the, the context in which this dashboard was developed and then walk you through some of the visualizations that are in it. Um, so my name is David, I'm a senior data analyst at the Government Accountability Office, um, and we work to uh, conduct of oversight of federal programs for the United States Congress. Um, it is it will be useful to understand a little bit about how we're organized. So the Government Accountability Office consists of 14 mission teams. Uh, 13 of those teams um, have sort of areas of subjects matter expertise. So some of them focus on you know, government-wide contracting, some of them focus on um, say natural resources and the environment, and then there are a bunch of teams that support those other teams in doing their work. I work in applied research, and so uh, my function is to help uh, teams work through uh, data analysis problems, particularly if they have things that are too large to crunch in Excel, that's, that's really where I step in. Um, so for, for the information we're looking at now, um, typically what happens is the, you know, the government-wide employee feedback survey goes out in uh, sort of late May, maybe, and comes back, the results come back aggregated um, at the level of division uh, within GAO in September, and then all of those files which arrive mystifyingly in HTML tables are then distributed to teams who are supposed to then try to find a way to derive meaning from not an exaggeration, like 100 pages of HTML tables. Um, uh, go to, uh, if you go to pdftables.com, it may actually not be better because like, it's, this, is, this is like all the things you hate about scraping HTML are in all of these tables which are generated by SAS. Long, long, long story. Five at the bar. Um, but so what, are, so what we were trying to do, and uh, the other things I mentioned is that because we have these teams, and these teams operate mostly independent of each other, um, you know, everybody gets their copy, everybody does their thing, lots of people pick visualizations that don't make a ton of sense for the message they're trying to represent, and so what, we've, what, what we were thinking about doing is trying to find a unified way to lift some of this burden off people by, um, you know, trying to be thoughtful, making sure we answer, understood what questions everybody was trying to answer. Um, based on the way the data are aggregated, there's really only so much you can do. Um, and so we, we tried to answer all of those questions, but as you'll see, a, a lot of the features of the dashboard are intended to make it easy for people to both share its results, but also move to other things if they're interested in reproducing um, or producing their own subsequent analysis, but it, it exports to something friendly. Uh, so where we start on this homepage is um, just with a few very brief, simple line graphs. My mouse is not here. That, that was a Rubio moment, guys, just so we're, we're clear. That's, that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so um, <laughs> So we have some basic line graphs. Uh, sitting on the home page, and these are meant to, you know, just give people immediately an impression of how the organization has performed into the current year, um, as well as giving them some context about the history of performance over those measures. So the things on top are internal measures uh, that we developed. So these top things called people measures are indices composed of quest uh, questions that we can talk about later. Um, some some questions about diversity and inclusion that we track. I should mention that all of this data right now is simulated, so um, I was not allowed to bring real data out of the building because we're kind of sensitive. But, um, so this, this data is all simulated, but there's a, a real version sitting uh, on the server somewhere that, that has real data for GAO. And then we have a couple of government-wide uh, measures at the bottom, the employee engagement index and the best places to work questions, which are uh, offered by the Partnership for Public Service. Um, and so then the, the, the idea is that you walk through the application and uh, increasing levels of granularity with more and more information. 
uh, to help you understand how your team is performing. And that's where a lot of the stuff on the sidebar comes in. So we can drop from the server. Okay. Um, so we start with some pretty simple heat maps, right? And so you, you can imagine trying to be, you know, if you're at the executive level, you don't necessarily want to do a lot of work to understand, uh, you know, look through a table of numbers. You just want to understand what's hot and what's not. That's that's a heat map. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's what this is. <laughs> that's what this is supposed to accomplish. So you can see that, for example, people in our financial markets team are very happy with the, uh, they think JAO is an excellent place to work on the simulated data, and then people in our defense team are not particularly satisfied with the organization's change management. Um, and then we can pres you can look at a similar view for the organization in one year, right? It's the same heat map, but you can also drill in and look at the results for a particular team. The next step is to look at something like uh, a question related to employee engagement. So you can think about um, some spark lines to tell you how you're performing across a diverse array of questions over time. And you can look at those things for um, people at different levels of the organization. Um, we have some, some charts that, and again, these are designed to answer some of the common questions that people had in looking at their data, how is my data this year different from how it was last year? And so on the left side, we have the, um, the categories that these survey questions are organized by, and then um, some points that illustrate you know, where things have increased or decreased. And then a similar view for looking at your team relative to the GAO average. And so what we're visualizing in each of these things is the difference between um, some target quantity of interest and another quantity. And you can do the same thing thinking about the staff who are here in DC uh, versus staff in the field. Um, you also do this area chart that lets you think about the distribution of responses to a particular question over time. So one of the things that's been a common feature of the analysis as it has been done that people are typically trying to collapse categories because it's a lot of information to take in at once. And so we try to you know, present all of that information, but in a way that is a little easier to digest. Um, and then finally, for the, the not visually inclined, uh, there's, a, there's a table. Um, yeah. Uh, so there are a couple, of other, you know, a couple of other things we did in this dashboard because this, this was part of a larger project. Uh, and thinking about employee engagement as a whole. And so what, we've, what we wanted to do was make it possible for people to you know, see problem areas in their team and understand, try to think about what things they could do to take action. And so we have here, there's not actually anything in these boxes, but the idea is you would say, I have a, you know, I have a problem in performance management and I can go to the performance management box and consult additional resources. And this is all stuff that you can just drop right into the Shiny application. And then uh, we do a lot of explaining about uh, how we computed things. So that's kind of this dashboard. I can talk more about um, sort of the context or reasoning uh, behind the choices we made here. Um, the other thing I would say, which is not strictly visually related, is that um, Shiny, had, you can use it for a lot of things that go beyond visualization. Um, and so in one other example that um, I worked on is something where typos. Um, because you know, we do our work in this team-based way, and there's, so there's lots of people. Most of them don't have a lot of technical expertise, and lots of them do a lot of their work in Excel, right? Um, and so you can think about having a situation where someone needs to recover or gets data from an agency in a format that uh, they don't know how to deal with, and I don't necessarily want to have to go convert that for them, right? For, so for example, Housing and Urban Development publishes uh, some of its tables in DBase, which, why, but <laughs> they do. Um, and so you can think, well, you know, you could just buy trans that transfer. Yes, you could. Um, 
since I work for the federal government, sentences that start with you could just buy tend to not fly very well with my management. Uh, so we thought, so I thought, well, you know, R has some very nice, reasonably fast data, data conversion utilities, right? And so if you take, you know, the Haven library, you take foreign, and you put a couple of web-friendly wrappers around it, you can tell people to upload their data and get it back in a format that they're comfortable working with. So that's, those are, like, you can use Shiny in addition to visualizing things for people who wouldn't be necessarily able to get there themselves. You can also think about using it to distribute small data analysis tasks where you don't necessarily need a person to be involved. Uh, so that's, that's all. So um, one question I have is, what was super surprising or what was something that you noticed in the data, um, not naming a name of an agency, I guess, because I don't know if you're allowed to say that, right. but what have you found very surprising with this data set? So the dashboard that we're talking about was mostly internally focused. Um, so we were only we were looking at data for um, our own agency. We do have, uh, GAO has published some work analyzing uh, federal employee viewpoint survey data, which I encourage you to review at your leisure. Um, <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that is, one of the consistent things that you you find not just in GAO, uh, but across the federal government is that people who are in management tend to be much happier than <laughs> everybody else. Um, and yeah, <laughs> shocking. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so the particular way that GAO structures its hiring is such that people who are in the level of the organization where you do the most work are pretty consistently the most unhappy, right? So you, if you look at if you look at the heat map, there's just this like giant band of dissatisfied people in this one position in the organization because they have the most responsibility but the least recognition of how hard they're actually working. So that's kind of one thing that becomes, it's kind of, it's always been known, but it's a lot easier to see when it's just like, here's the band of unhappy people. <laughs> uh, you kind of mentioned it towards the end that the data conversion tools were really useful, but were there any other considerations that influenced going with Shiny Apps versus building things using you know, D3 or any of the other number of tools that are out there? Uh, I just, I happen to be comfortable working in R. That's, so that's how it happened. So I actually want to add to the comment about the utility of Shiny Apps. Um, I've used it quite a bit for my own personal interests, but also at work. I had to search through a list of 10,000 UN procurement codes and just created my own little search engine on Shiny. I did it in a half hour so that I didn't have to type every time that I wanted to search something, so it's great for that. I have created a sign-up sheet for my Toastmasters group on Shiny, put it up on AWS so everybody can go to it, sign up, whatever. Um, I've just recently created a recipe app to capture my recipes, be able to search through them, things like that. So Shiny is incredibly useful. I just wanted to add to the utility of it. Um, another question, kind of similar to the one I asked before. How do data-oriented people, individuals, or federal employees score on your uh, evaluation within the federal government? As far as, far as I know, um, and I could be wrong about this, but I have not seen a federal employee viewpoint survey break out by occupation series, so I have no way to answer that question. Okay. Holding down the northeast corner of the room here. Uh, curious, and this is something I come across a lot, is like how to visualize you know, things like sampling error, and if we didn't have like, error bars or anything on there. Because I mean, obviously, it's valuable in one sense to indicate you know, uncertainty when differences shouldn't be taken you know, too seriously. The other hand, it's more information, it's more clutter. So, I mean, if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, there's, we had a lot of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, conflict about this. So the one thing that distinguishes the survey that GAO administers from uh, the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey is that ours is technically a census. So 
Um, there is, in some sense, you are not as worried about visualizing error because it's got, we ask everybody. Um, this is who, was, who responded. And the other thing is that the summary information that we're working with doesn't really enable a great deal of like, here is how we estimated this point estimate. Um, so the, uh, the version I showed you does not include some of the, like, the latest changes that we've made, but we have wrestled with, particularly on the dot plots, just sticking error bars on them to say, like, here is actually the range of differences that um, we're attempting to present to you. So it's, it's something we've thought about, and it's a continuing dialogue on how to present that in a way that doesn't get you yelled at by people who are like, I don't know what this means. I don't know what the tape means. I just wanted the bar charts. No, no one knows what it means, but it's provocative. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? One last round of applause, please. <laughs> to, to the more interesting part, and then to the bar. So. Are you straight quiet? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> uh, so we have three presentations. Uh, we have um, make money. <laughs> make it rain. Yeah, I'm not going to do that after uh, Kate's presentation. <laughs> um, so, and of course we have the books that they have uh, access to. So, Kate, let's hear it. Yes, sir. Mr. Clare. And Mr. Aja. I think that's a runoff between the last two. So number one is chosen, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know, is number one clear? <laughs> pretty sure that's clear. Let's have a runoff again between the last two. So Claire, let's hear it. It's more for like hearing if a wolf is going to attack me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I, I count 11, 12, 13. Are people allowed to vote twice? Uh, is there an instant? No, I mean, I, unfortunately, I don't have an ID system set up, so vote early, vote often, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to have a data biz registry or something. Okay, Mr. Aja. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, I just got it. All right, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> okay, so Kate, come on up, please. And the end of data visualization tonight and um, thank you for coming out we're going to go over to big hunt afterwards and uh, you know we've got a couple more minutes before they absolutely kick us out there's a few years left and thank you all for coming